Thanks for joining me. This is Christopher Lockhead, Follow Your Different, where we aspire to have real conversations that celebrate the people, ideas, and companies that stand out. We're sponsored by our friends at Oracle NetSuite. Learn how to turbocharge the growth of your business today at netsuite.com forward slash different. And when you're there, you can set up a free growth review with an expert in your industry. Check out netsuite.com slash different. We're also sponsored by growwire.com. This is an awesome new website, a resource for entrepreneurs focusing on stories of innovation and growth. Check out growwire.com. On this episode, we gain some incredible insights from Professor Margaret Neal from none other than Stanford University. We dig into her research-based approach into negotiation, uh, teams, diversity, and more. Uh, you'll gain insights into things about nego negotiation that you've probably not heard before. She certainly taught me some new things. Um, for example, why great negotiators do not engage in a battle or fight. That that's actually a broken paradigm, the win-lose paradigm. And she talks about the three components of collaborative problem solving and a whole lot more. Uh, to check out the professor's background and key takeaways from this episode, go to lockhead.com and um, strap yourself in. Hey ho, let's go. Because I think that too often we have a lot of beliefs about negotiation, a lot of intuitions about negotiation that a lot of people repeat that are not supported by empirical evidence. And so part of what I've tried to do in my work and in my teaching is to really give people a sense of um, how to think about negotiation more broadly. And, yeah. and in doing so, using some strategies and tactics that are probably not in the mainstream, although some of them are. It's not, I'm not, I don't throw them all out whole, whole cloth, but, um, you know, there are a lot of things I try to have people focus on because of the focus and the emphasis on empirical research. So maybe let me think about sort of uh, one of the big mental constructs that's been present in my career as a business executive for uh, and negotiating all kinds of deals and things over years, um, there's this sort of unquestioned context that if you and I are in a negotiation, uh, and let's say we're dealing with the price part of it, which is always a big discussion, of course, and, uh, you know, we can't, we can't just tell you, I can't just tell you where I want to land on price or vice versa, that I got to start way over here and you got to start way over there. And then we sort of argue each other down to the middle. So if you, if I start at 10 and you start at two and, you know, may, maybe we end up somewhere in the middle there and, and that we, we call that victory. And so this, I, this idea that in order to get what I want in negotiation, I can't be candid and truthful about it, I got to start meaningfully above where I want and, and you do the same meaning for you below and we kind of meet somewhere in the middle. Um, w w what do you think about that? What does the research tell you about that? Well, one of the, for the first thing you're thinking about is that it's, you're talking about a single issue, which is price. And, and really you're talking about value claiming. And if you think about negotiation, negotiation, the, really the challenge in negotiation is that you are trying in most situations, to trade off value creation and value claiming. So how big is the pool of resources over which we will decide the allocation, and then what is that allocation? And the problem is these aren't independent processes. So, um, you know, we'd be a lot better if negotiations were only about value creation or only about value claiming. Um, but what we have is that in, in most negotiations there, there really are, there's a, there's a requirement for us to sort of deal with both of those competing perspectives simultaneously. So what you have just said is let's, let's just, let's take away all the value creation. We know how big the pie is. Are we, well, we could know, we may not know. And that's why I'm, because we don't know, I'm going to start really high and you're going to start really low. But if, but what that suggests is a strategy of let's just split the difference. And it turns out that strategically, if that's your uh, MO, then what you have just done, as I observe your behavior over time, is you encourage me to be more extreme in my first offers or more extreme in my counter offer so that when we split the difference, I come out ahead. So your behavior by focusing on a single issue, often price, 
and saying, let's just, you know, we go, I go one way, you go the other, and we, we fight to the middle or we just agree to be in the middle, we now encourage both of us to be more extreme, thereby creating a situation where we're less likely to be able to actually find an outcome that works. That has also been my experience. <laughs> And uh, particularly with uh, a company or a group of individuals or a individual that you negotiate with on a semi-regular basis, as you know, many of us do with customers by way mm -hmm. of example, right? You may do a deal this year and come back and do another deal next year, hopefully, if you build a good relationship and things along those lines. Mm -hmm. So if, if, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, uh, Maggie, but if that's kind of a broken paradigm or maybe a less than powerful paradigm, however you might think of it, what is the, what, how, what, what should my mindset be? If you and I were to be in a negotiation, um, what's a good mindset for, for us to start with? So for me, I want to move people away from the concept of negotiation as battle. And really what you characterize it is as a battle. I'm going to try to get stuff from you that you don't want me to have. And I'm going to try to keep you from getting my stuff. And that, that, that mindset creates all sorts of collateral damage because when I have this view of negotiation as battle, then that, that mindset, that, fit, that becomes the filter through which I evaluate all your behaviors, right? So, and I'm going to, and because that is a kind of a bat sort of uh, me versus you, us versus them, uh, good versus evil, it becomes a filter through which I evaluate all your behaviors. And I make my most malevolent interpretation of those behaviors because you're the other, you're the enemy. In addition, what happens is when I have this mindset, then, um, then I'm ready for a fight. And even if you, you and I are negotiating, I walk into your office, for example, I'm all armored up and ready for a battle. Even if you weren't, you see that behavior on my part. And then you're likely to reciprocate that. So we both get kind of amped up into this battle mindset. But I think also importantly, if, if I have a mindset of a battle, then what really becomes important is winning that battle. And sometimes the notion of winning becomes so much more important than what it is we've won. The fact that I've actually beaten you now seems to be the goal of the interaction. So, so that common mindset is a problem. And so what I, what I suggest is, is that we need to think about negotiation differently to move from the view of negotiation as battle to negotiation as collaborative problem solving. But a lot of people have used those terms and, and I don't, what I don't mean when I say collaborative problem solving is let's all get together. Everybody feels good. We have group hugs at the end. It's win, win. And you know, there's rainbows and unicorns and you know, sort of stars and you know, glitter everywhere. So that, that there's some happy horse shit there. That's not reality. Is that what yeah. you're telling me? <laughs> um, exactly. And so, the, but, and oftentimes people think that we can, you know, that negotiations, good negotiations either end up with this battle or they end up in this kind of, you know, sort of kumbaya experience. Um, so when I talk about collaborative problem solving, there are three components to that. Number one is that I, uh, and, and sort of viewing myself as the protagonist in this negotiation, I am better off, better off than my status quo, better off than my alternatives, you know, better off than had I not negotiated. Now, that may seem like a low bar, but I suspect that you, or certainly I, have negotiated, and at the moment, the second, when I was about to say yes, I knew I should say no, and I said yes anyway, right? Because I privileged agreement over the quality of the deal. So the first thing is I need to be made better off, right? No, that's number one. Number two, because there is no command and control in negotiation, I can't force you to say yes. All that I can do is present proposals to you where it is in your interest to say yes. So I need to be able to answer the following question before I begin negotiating. Why would you, my counterpart, say yes to my proposal or yes to whatever I present? Because from your perspective, you have to at least be kept whole. Otherwise, there's no reason for you to say yes. Well, so I, I would assume most people want to be kept whole and, whole and have some upside. There's something. And that would be great. So I would like, I have to at least keep you whole. Perhaps I can make you better off. Okay. So those, that's a criteria for you. But that means I need to understand who you are. I need to understand your preferences, your interests, your motives. I need to understand your problems. I need to understand why you're at the table with me today in this situation. 
Those, that's number two. Number three is, what I have to actually be very concerned about is that when I present a proposal, what I'm going to do is to present that proposal as a solution to a problem that you have. Too often in negotiation, we focus on things like, I want to raise, I want this, I want that, right? And so you should give this to me. Uh, and we forget that negotiation is an interdependent process. I can't get what I want unless you voluntarily walk the path of agreement with me. Now, I, I hate to interrupt um, you, Maggie, but I want to maybe underscore that. You said negotiation is a interdependent process? Yes. I love that. Can you just maybe tease that one out a little bit for me? Yeah, this, negotiation is a process where I can't do it by myself. I depend upon you and you depend upon me. That's the, the nature of the interdependency. So unlike situations that are we often characterize as command and control, like I can tell you I'm your boss. Okay, that's also a fantasy too, but we at least have the belief about that. I can tell you what to do and then you will do it. In negotiation, I, as a member of this interaction, always have the opportunity to walk away. So if you make extreme demands, my response is, no, thank you, right? So in yeah. order to get a deal, I've got to craft a proposal yes. from your perspective, which makes sense to you. Right. And one of the best ways to do that is to actually listen, surprisingly, listen to you as you tell me about what you want, why you want what you want, and listen to the problems that you're raising, the concerns you have, and then frame my proposal as a solution to a problem that you have. So I want to make sure I understand this radical thinking here, Professor. <laughs> 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 to have a good negotiation, I need to be a human being who engages in a real conversation about w what matters to the other and then figure out how I can help make a difference, be a solution to the, the things that the other human being wants or needs. That's, you've got, almost got it right. Okay. The only thing you're missing is in a way that's good for me. In a way that's good for you, the other party. The, no, the protagonist, right? Oh, the person. So the, the, yeah. I need to find a solution to a problem that you have that makes me better off. Yes. And is that what Covey called a win-win back in the Seven Habits days? Or how, how do you think well, about it? Well, you know, you, you go to Covey. I go to Fisher and Urey, which is in the 19, early 1980s before Covey wrote his books. Um, well, and you're that a lot was, more learned it, than me, and you probably don't drink as much scotch as I do. <laughs> <laughs> that was called Getting to Yes, uh, the book 1981. And um, here's the challenge, though. Um, and, and this is something that, is, that has haunted me for my entire academic life. <laughs> uh, I, have take, I, I find getting to yes, the book, right, a problem. And I find getting to yes, the title, we don't even have to open the book yet. I don't like the title. And the reason I don't like the title is because while it's an awesome marketing experience, right, let me tell you, getting to yes is a wonderful title if you want people to remember it, okay? Perfect, wonderful, great. As a, as a conceptual title about a book on negotiation, it is simply wrong because the goal of a negotiation is not to get to yes. The goal of a negotiation is to get a good deal. And that deal may be only found with a no. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and the other thing I'm curious about, um, if I think about, any meaningful negotiation I've been in, um, unless it's like you're buying a car and you're walking away and it, you could really care less about the car dealership yeah. after that, which I, I, I assume some, maybe you'll tell me some percentages in negotiations are like that, where you're, you get the deal done and you probably never see the other person and you don't care about a relationship post the exchange of, uh, 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 of money. But let's move that to the side for the second. If there is a relationship component to what happens afterwards, which most of the major deals, transactions mm -hmm. I've been involved with, uh, that's actually why you're spending so much time in the negotiation is because you're planning to live together and go do this work or whatever this thing, you know, there's a, there's a relationship around this negotiation that you're trying to build. And so to your point, 
it isn't about yes you could, you you know maybe you're a way better negotiator than me and maybe you pull out your super ding dong stanford negotiation tricks and you pin me down and and you get to yes and then one you know a week later i wake up and i go geez i think maggie might have really screwed me on that deal and now we have a two year relationship that we agreed to or whatever and so i i guess what i'm trying to say is somebody who's been through this so many times what I real for me in any negotiation, what lives with me the most is, hey, we're trying to do something together. I'm going to be, quote unquote, living with this person in one way or another for some period of time. And I've been on the back end of these things where they're great. And I've been on the back end of these things where they're horrible. And, you know, I'm a 50 year old guy. I, I don't want to be on the back end of anything that's horrible anymore. <laughs> and so I, that's a long preamble, I know. But is that sort of what you're talking about that in a, in a relationship that where there's a negotiation, where there's an ongoing component to this, we actually do need to land in a place that's kind of good for both sides. And we're kind of on, on the same side now at the end of the negotiation or, or how should I think about that? Well, I think that um, there are a lot of, there, there's a lot to unpack in that preamble that you've just given me. So let me kind of walk through a couple of things and we can come back to it if I've missed a few. Um, and the first is that if you're thinking about negotiation as battle, right, then you've got to pick and choose your negotiations based on who you're willing to pick a fight with, right? So if you take this perspective that negotiation is collaborative problem solving, then so many more things become open to negotiate because now I don't have to wait until I find something sufficiently important that it's worth the fight, right? So that, make, that, that expands the possibilities. But secondly, it is rare that we are in a negotiation where it's one and done. Most of the people with whom we negotiate are folks with whom we have or have the potential for a relationship. So there's, so the likelihood, sort of the specter of tomorrow looms large in many negotiations. And so part of the issue is how can I engage in an interaction where, you know, through the process of information exchange and, and basically strategic understanding of the other, we can craft a solution that makes, that is actually better than any one of us could have done by ourselves, right? That's what you're looking for. Because what, at the end of the day, in these ongoing interactions, you're really trying to realize the synergy that exists between you and your counterpart. And sometimes we think about that, and this is why thinking about negotiation as battle just destroys that whole perspective because yeah. negotiation as battle says, who's going to win, me or you? What, what we talk about when we talk about collaborative problem solving is, is that we, we need to be in a situation where, where actually the outcome is better because we interacted. Yes. Not than what we could have done by ourselves. Yes. And I, I find myself, the more I do this and the older I get, um, I try harder to think about in any kind of a deal, uh, not just what my boundaries and bottom mm -hmm. lines are, the things that I need to have. Because uh, I do, you tell me, this may be stupid, but I, I think if you don't have a walkaway position, you don't have a position. Mm -hmm. And some of those are financial and some of those are other things. Um, so I think being clear about that's important. But that said, when you're in any kind of a meaningful negotiation, I try to think about how do I make this better for the other person? And um, given this is going to be a long-term relationship, I look, and this may sound corny, maybe I've lived on the West Coast too long, but like... I want them to feel great about it. If they feel bad about it, like why do why do we want to do business where somebody feels like they got screwed or it wasn't fair or it, it, it doesn't make any sense to me why we would want to come from that place. And so what I think I hear you saying is from a mental standpoint, try to sit on the same side of the table. Is that a corny way to think about it? Well, yeah, because what you're, what you're saying is, you know, it's not you against me. It's us against whatever problem we're facing, right? Yeah. So how do we solve the problem, right? And, and that's, that's why, for me, I've moved to this notion of collaborative problem solving. Let's find a way that, that I'm, and I'm not saying I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not being altruistic, right? I, I will be in this situation because things are better for me with this outcome than without this outcome, as they are for you. Right. But I need to understand that both of us have agency. We can always walk away. Now, what I also do is a lot of research on how to make my counterpart feel better about their outcomes while I get more of what I want. Sure. And that's actually useful too because I do, by the end of the, at the end of a negotiation, 
I want my counterpart to feel subjectively that they have really achieved something, that they have gotten a good deal. I cannot tell you the number of times that people have said to me, well, you know, a friend of mine once said, or usually it's more often, my lawyer said <laughs> that if both parties are unhappy, it's a great deal. I, I've I'm heard like, that for no! 30 years. I'm like, it's how can that be true? <laughs> so that that is not true. <laughs> Well, uh, it might be true if you are on a one time, you know, and I know I've beaten you and I've made you think I'm unhappy, but I'm really not. I'm really happy because if we're both unhappy, seriously, why would you say yes? Why would either one of us say yes to that deal? Right. It ma makes no sense. Now, the other one I'm curious to kind of tease tease out with you. We had uh, Chris Voss on the podcast a, a while ago now. Uh, he wrote uh, Never Split the Difference. Uh, former FBI negotiator, terrorism negotiator, fascinating guy. Do, do you know him by chance? I don't know him personally. I know of him. Yeah. And he said something that has been rolling around in my head since then, and I can't make sense of it. Um, I, I'm the kind of person on the key things in any deal, the economics, of course, but other important T's and C's, where I, I try to be a direct communicator, um, I, I value people who are straight, you know, who just tell you like it is. And so I have long thought that if you and I are in a negotiation, uh, whether it's economics or any of the other important terms and conditions, that I should just tell you, hey, you know, Maggie, these are the economics that are going to work for me, for us. And, and there's a couple other things we really care about. And these are those things. And, and just be straight up with you about it, not play that silly game we talked about off the top mm -hmm. and just sort of tell you. Now, um, Chris Voss, if I remember, said that's a really dumb thing to do. You know, that if we're negotiating something and the, then the something's $10,000 that, you know, if I just say to you, you know, Maggie, what's going to get this thing done on the, on the math is 10 grand. And, you know, can you, can you do the 10 grand? Can't you do the 10 grand? We have a no bullshit mm -hmm. conversation about it. He thinks that going in with your sort of uh, the bottom line, bottom line, you know, where you want to be is is a big, big mistake. If I, if you know, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but if, mouth, but if I remember his book and remember mm -hmm. our conversation, and and I have been unable to get past that because I just feel better about when we're when we're getting to that place and we're down to the short, you know, mm -hmm. the short stroke, so to speak. That I just rather say to you, you know what. If we can do this at 10 grand, Maggie, we're going to be good and, and not BS you that, you know, it's 15 grand and do that whole thing. And so I'm just curious what your reaction to that is, that being sort of very candid and clear and declarative. All right. So here's a, there, the, my reaction will not be simple. Okay. So here it goes. Number one, if what you're talking about is your bottom line, your reservation price, your point of indifference between a yes and a no. This is arguably the most strategic piece of information in your negotiation, right? Because what it tells you is, where's that point where you say, I'm going to walk? Now, the problem is, is that in the natural course of negotiations, people will typically ask you for your bottom line, right? And, the, and, and you have probably asked your counterparts, they have asked you, and so let me just, let's just do a little hot couple of hypotheticals. So you and I are negotiating and, and you say to me, you know, time is money. I'd like to get a hundred dollars for this thing, but what's your bottom line? Right. And I say 50. Okay. Now we now have two ends of the continuum, right? 150. I, what you think I've told you is that the least I will, the, the most I will pay is 50. Right. So, do you believe me? Well, there's one way to test it. <laughs> yeah. Which is to say, well, Maggie, that's, I understand that, but we need to get 100 on this thing, and uh, if we can't, we don't have a deal. Right. So, the proposal, you're, what you're making is, of course, completely accurate. The only way to know if it's my true bottom line is, will I walk away? Yes. Okay. And do you subscribe to that axiom, if you don't have a walk away position, then you don't have a position? Yeah, I do. You In do. fact, I, I am very, um, religious is not quite the word, but I'm very adamant about when I try to work with my, my students um, and when I advise folks, I say, you need to have a bottom line. And what most people do is they, they have, I call it a reservation 
price, like a specific, like what is, the, what is that? It's, it's a, it is a bright line standard that you do not violate. People will tell you, oh yeah, this is my true bottom line. And yet if you push them on it, it's not their true bottom line. They're not so indifferent that they'll flip a coin. And if it, if, you know, let's say, let's say that my true bottom line was 50 in that little hypothetical, then if, if you offer me 50, I should flip a coin. And if it have, comes up heads, I say yes. And if it comes up tails, I say no. That's how indifferent I should be. Okay. Most people do not have either A, the foresight to identify their reservation price or the discipline to maintain it. Right. That last one, I think, is a very yes. powerful one because and exactly. I have walked away from many deals only to some months later, some years later in some cases, have that deal back on the table and, and if not get what exactly what I wanted, a, a lot closer than we were three yep. months ago, six months ago. And there, I'm sure you've heard this term, emotional sunk costs. You know, if you and I have been doing this for a few days, you know, or a few months in the case of a big business transaction, not unusual. Um, it's very, people get emotionally into it and they can't even imagine walking away and, and they get stuck. It, it, mm -hmm. I mean, that's been my experience and people are always shocked when I'm willing to walk away. So have you ever heard of the $20 auction? Uh, Yes, but um, it's been a while, and I I want to hear how you do it. So please educate me. So um, this started out actually with Martin Schubick, who did a dollar auction, but you know prices have risen. So um, you know then we moved to a twenty dollar auction, and some of my colleagues have done hundred dollar bill auctions, right? So I auctioned off a twenty dollar bill, and um, there this is a real auction. I will I will give the twenty dollars to the highest bidder. So I have a class. Usually I do this in class. I, I'll give $20 to the highest bidder. Um, and so here are the rules. Number one, bidding starts at a dollar and every subsequent bid is a dollar more than the previous bid. Okay, so it just goes up a dollar at a time. You may not make two, no individual can make two consecutive bids. So you can't bid $6 and then bid seven. Okay, so you can bid six, somebody else has to bid seven, then you can bid eight. I don't know why somebody would want to bid two is twice in a row, but you can't do it. That's the rules, okay? Isn't that another rule? You're not supposed to bid against yourself? <laughs> well, yeah, probably. <laughs> Number three is no talking except for bidding, okay? That's all we're doing. We're just bidding here. It's just open outcry. And the fourth and most important rule is, while I will give the $20 bill to the highest bidder, the second highest bidder also pays and receives nothing. Oh, I like that one a lot. And which people say, they look at, they kind of go, ooh, and I say, hey, if you don't want to be in my auction, don't bid. Okay, it's my rules. Here are my rules. You want to play. Those are the rules. So there's real consequences for coming in second. Yeah. So we start off, and the bidding is pretty fast and furious because, you know, people are like, oh, yeah, dollar, two dollars, three dollars, four dollars. So you get, to, you get to 19 pretty quickly? Well, actually, the first lull is at 10 and 11. Okay. Because then the students as a group realize, oh, she's whole now, right? Because eleven twenty dollar bid, the eleven dollar bid has to pay me and gets the twenty. Seems like a re but the ten dollar bid, I'm now I'm ahead, right? So then at about that time, two people are now bidding against each other. And the most that I have ever received for a twenty dollar bill in the aggregate, adding up both the winner and the second second highest bidder was $335. <laughs> this is a great example of how the house always wins, isn't it, Maggie? <laughs> well, this, this is your emotional sunk cost. What this is, is an instantiation of how powerful sunk costs are. Because at any point, people could have stopped. But what happens is, is that they think this is a good deal. And so let me just kind of ratchet it up. And then they get to 20. And the and by the way, it's, it's quite humorous to watch because what happens at about, about $18, there's a $17 bidder and an $18 bidder. And the $18 bidder goes, okay, I'll bid seven. They bid 17, I bid 18. Then they'll bid 19, I'll bid 20, and it's done. Right. And so we get to 20, and I look at the $19 bidder, and I say, going once, going twice. And that bidder says 21 because – I can lose 20 for certain, but if I win the bet at 21, the auction, then I only pay a dollar. And after that, 
we just have, we're just limited by how much money you have in your pocket. Because, That's when shit gets really weird. Yeah, nobody wants to be the idiot who lost. <laughs> it's one thing to be the idiot who paid, you know, hundred and whatever seventy dollars for a twenty dollar bill, but what about the guy who paid one hundred and sixty nine dollars and got nothing? Right, but but isn't it intellectually? Don't you say once we're north of twenty, uh, the two top bidders are both idiots at that point? Is that yeah. is that? And so, but this, but this is not an unusual experience because what happens oftentimes in negotiations is we we kind of continue a bad deal because we can't walk away. Um, yeah. Because we look at agreement as the only metric of success. Hmm. And so I think this is just, and it's just a very powerful form of, of sort of we get we get trapped with our with our own expectations that we have to get to a deal. Doesn't this also, this may sound like a crazy non sequitur, but doesn't this sort of explain the Cuban Missile Crisis by way of example? You know, there's some crazy game of chicken in the human psyche that starts to happen in things like this. Um, well, I think that it certainly explains a lot of, of, of behaviors that we see as, um, I mean, the basically, we human beings really don't have a clear understanding of the power of sunk costs to drive our behavior. Now, you know, one of the things that, and this, uh, this is tongue in cheek, so let me just acknowledge that up front. But when I talk about MBA education, I say, you know what? We spend, spend two years here at Stanford training people to be MBAs, okay? Give them an MBA degree. I said, we're actually teaching them one thing. It's really hard to learn, but it's one thing. Here it is. Ignore sunk costs, pay attention to opportunity costs. We teach that in a variety of different ways. We teach it in organizational behavior. We teach it in marketing. We teach it in finance. We teach it in accounting. Ignore sunk cost. Pay attention to opportunity costs. What do people do? They pay attention to sunk cost and ignore opportunity costs. And so to be able to really grab that perspective and make it part of your sort of mindset is hugely difficult because we have never paid an opportunity cost. It's a foregone opportunity, yeah. but we have paid every sunk cost. And so they loom large in our minds. Because we don't, we don't sort of calculate the ones that got away, so to speak? Yeah, exactly. We, don't, we never pay an opportunity cost. It's just a foregone opportunity. We don't know well, what's going happen. When you've been around a little bit longer, like I, I, I look at decisions I made in the past and go, oh, shit, I think that one probably cost me $25 million. Like that was a dumbass. You know, I could tell you a, a decision I made in March of, ni uh, March of 2000 that was really stupid that had I not made that decision, my net worth would be meaningfully different. And so, <laughs> and, and do human beings not necessarily look back on their life and go, geez, you know, at the, at the fork in the road, I really took the wrong, the wrong road. No, I think people do go back and look. The problem is not going back. It's what happens in the, in the moment. So I I'm don't learn with, from that past lost opportunity cost is well, what I think you're saying. It's hard to learn. Yeah. It's hard to learn because this is why, you know, and you may have learned better than, some people learn better than others, but the, this is why folks find it difficult to believe you can walk away. Because then you really are saying, hey, the sunk cost, I'm, I don't care how much time I've spent here. I'm looking ahead and what I could do differently. So I've always tried to tell myself there is no sunk cost. Like it, it, it's in the past. You did it. And so if you spent a hundred grand on that and it's not turning out, the stupidest thing to do is spend another dollar on that. And mm -hmm. I try to be that kind of a person. I'm sure I fall into the trap. I'm not saying I'm not a human yeah. being that doesn't fall into this trap. And so I guess this leads me back to the question. If I'm one of your students and we're at $19 and it's about to get stupid and then somebody says 20 and then somebody says 21, how do I, if you will, <laughs> regain some consciousness here and go, uh, brr, brr, um, just stop doing this dumb thing and take your medicine like a big boy and, and move forward to a different opportunity. How do I gain that level of consciousness, awareness, intelligence, what, what, however you might think of it? Well, again, it's very difficult. Not everybody bids on the $20 bill past the crazy point. Uh, but because what happens is we're not thinking very systematically. 
because what we get caught up in is how good is this out? How good could this outcome be for me? Right? I mean, getting $20 for $4 or $1 is a great deal. But I forget the fact that this whole thing, that there's lots of other people who have the same thought. And what happens? And I kind of, I don't pay attention to the, I don't pay as much attention as I need to about the fact that even though the rule is completely transparent, that the second highest bidder pays, I think I'll be the first bidder, not the second bidder. In fact, I don't even think about the second bidder. I'm like, hey, a dollar, pay a dollar, get 20. What a great deal. So what does that tell us about human behavior? (laughs) It tells us a lot. It tells us that, in fact, it's easy for people. There are suckers born every minute. I think that that's sort of P.T. Barnum once said that, right? Some variation of that. But I think part of it is, is how hard it is. And this is one of the things that I think is, is the real learning, is that it is so hard that once we have started down a path to change that path. And I can tell you, I'll sort of give you a, one of my own stories, and this is not nearly a $25 million decision, but my dad was, um, was an engineer, educated all his life, worked as an engineer. And before I became an academic, I went through three different careers. So I have a bachelor's and master's degree in pharmacy. I was never planning on being a pharmacist. I was going to be a physician. But then I decided I didn't want to be a physician. And then I was too young to be a pharmacist anyway. So that's why I got my master's. And then while I was in my pharmacy master's, I discovered psychology and then eventually transitioned to becoming a therapist. And then from there, I transitioned to organizational behavior, right? So I had three different careers, basically. And my dad, at every career point, said, you're an idiot. Quit going back to school. You have a job that pays well. Pharmacy, by the way, just, you know, as an aside, was the best paying undergraduate major back in the 70s that, that there was. And he said, you have a wonder, it's, it's clean work, you're in a store, you know, it pays well. And I go, I'm bored. I can't do this for the next 45 years, right? And so I went into psychology because it was interesting, you know? And so, and every time I made a, a, a career change, he'd go, what are you doing? And I go, he says, you've already had been educated. You've paid all that money. And I go, some cost, dad. I, it's, what, it's, what, it's the 40 years ahead of me that I'm looking at, not the five years behind me. Yes. And for him, it was because he said, look, this is, I can't believe you're doing this. Right. You're, you're wasting throwing time. away your education. You're yeah. wasting all like, this pharmacy knowledge yeah. and experience and goodness. Yeah, exactly. So I had all these three careers. It wasn't until the third one I finally found one I liked and I stayed with it. So now if this is too personal, feel free to kick me under the table, Maggie. But why is it after three careers you have stayed with uh, being a prof in a way that you didn't with the other two careers? Well, so so the kind of in hyperbole. Pharmacy was a really, the way it was practiced, not the way I was educated, but the way it was practiced is a really boring job. Uh, And they paid a lot. And then I went into therapy, which was a really interesting job that paid a little. I said, how can I find a job (laughs) that will give me a livable wage and it's interesting? Academia. And it turns out that this is the best job in the world because I I can reinvent myself. I can decide what I want to study. I can, I ha- and I have. I started off with studying conflict. I moved to negotiation. From negotiation, I moved to teams. From teams, I moved to diversity. I've got four different areas that I can opine on or profess on. And I have important things to say on all of them. And I love talking about all those things because at the, at the end, it really is about synergy. How do we realize the synergy that exists between people? So there's a main theme but I can reflect that theme in a variety of different ways. It's the and, best job in the world. And you also seem to be somebody who's got a, a curious mind and a curious mind that's fairly uh, wide ranging or roaming. So you, you like this ability to be curious and roam around and maybe connect some dots that haven't quite been connected because you're sort of roaming here and roaming there and connecting one thing from something you, is that what's going on? Pretty much part of what um, I remember from one of my doctoral students who, who, who was the, the, um, the catalyst for changing me from negotiation to looking at innovative teams. Uh, he said, I don't want to just study negotiation under you because everybody will just think I'm your clone. I want to study teams. And I go, well, I don't know much about teams, 
he said, you're young, you can learn. <laughs> and I did. And so there was a whole area of teams because, you know, he basically said, here's a fork in the road. How about if we take this one? And yeah. it didn't stop me from studying negotiation. It just expanded what I was interested in. So uh, I, I want to talk to you about both diversity and teams if we could. But uh, before we go there, if you were sort of to say to me, hey, Christopher, this, this, these are the one or two things or maybe three that you tell me that if you did differently than most people in negotiation, you would have a meaningful change in, in the kind of outcomes that you produce in the next deal mm -hmm. that you negotiate. What, what would you guide me towards that maybe wouldn't be the obvious? Well, the first thing I would say is you need to know what your reservation price is what your bottom line is. And you yep. need to have the discipline to honor that. So that's number one, because that really tells you, you know, where a deal goes from being, you know, you're indifferent to positive to you got to walk away from this thing. Yeah. Okay. And, and I had one of these recently. It was with a company. Uh, I do a little bit of work these days as kind of an advisor, investor type guy and uh met the ceo he was fascinating and you know got excited about his company he wanted me involved he'd read my book and da, da, you know all the stars were aligning mm -hmm. and he came back to me with a set of economics that that I, I, I fell off the table how shitty i thought they were and i sort of said to him we'll just call him jimmy you know jimmy uh like we're not even close. And he says, yeah, but you know, I have this super ding dong guy and I only gave him this and then, and, then, and, then, and this is like the best deal ever. And we're going to be worth, you know, zillions of dollars. And he was trying to explain to me, what, what did you call it? You called it, he was, he was value claiming, I guess, to use your term. Mm -hmm. And I was like doing the math and I was walking him through the math that I was doing. I'm like, ah, and, and, you know, he kept selling me on it so much so that he was trying to say to me essentially, hey, if you don't do this, you're really stupid. I've built these other companies that are hugely valuable and this and that and the other. But at the end of the day, I was like, I just thought this makes no sense to me. And so I said, well, Jimmy, I, I, I'm going to walk. And I did. Mm -hmm. And look, he may end up being the next, you know, Google or Cisco or Oracle or whatever, but I will always know that in that moment with the information that I had based on what mattered to me, that deal didn't make any sense to me. And I, I, I don't, I haven't lost any sleep about it. Well, I think that that's, that's exactly right. And the problem, and here's the outcome. Even if he were to become the next, whatever, Intel, Cisco, whatever, the problem is that you made the decision on the information that you had at the moment. And that information suggests that, that what he would, it just didn't make any sense. And so, you know, one of my, my co-author on the book, on uh, negotiation that we wrote in 2015 is an economist. And what he does really well is he does the back of the envelope calculations and says, this doesn't make any sense, right? How can this possibly be the case? Yeah. And I have relied on him. He saved me from a lot of really bad decisions <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, we walk through a lot of things together and he's like, you know, either this doesn't make sense. This does make sense from an economic perspective. And I help him, with the more um, psychological perspectives of yes. the kind of decisions he's looking at. So it's so a nice first, collaboration. But so the first thing, the first advice first you'd is, give me is be very, very line. clear on that walk yeah. away, that bottom line mm -hmm. discipline. Okay. Well, would there be others? Oh, yes, there are lots of others. <laughs> Number two is, and this is, and I'm really talking about the person at the, so set an aspiration. You need to set an optimistic assessment of what you could achieve. And too often what folks do, even those folks who actually think about a reservation price, because your reservation price is the worst possible deal you could say yes to. You need an aspiration price to offset the power of your mind focusing on the reservation. Because there's a really powerful psychological process to which we are all subject. And I can describe it. And it's really easy to describe. It's really powerful. Three words, expectations drive behaviors. Hmm. If what I'm thinking about is my reservation price, the worst possible deal I could say yes to, if that's where my mind is, that's where I will end up. What I must also do is literally leverage up my expectations about what is possible. 
Now, sometimes when I talk aspirations, people say, oh, you mean just be crazy, be blue sky. I go, no. An aspiration is an optimistic assessment. So I look at me, my situation, my counterpart, their situation. I say, if things went really well, what could I achieve here? And that's, that's my focus. Now, I'm rarely going to achieve that. It's not likely to happen. But having that, on average, I will do better. So it's so interesting you say this. Um, my, so I've been a CMO of three public tech companies. And during the negotiation for my last one, um, we, were ha- we were getting down to the price discussion. And they had the HR team go out and do all this benchmarking of, you know, what CMOs in similar size companies got paid and this and that and the other. And, and I didn't know they were doing this. But so then they, when they're presenting the offer to me and I, I looked at the economics and I said, uh, we're not even in the ballpark. Mm-hmm. And they said, yeah, but we went out and we hired, you know, blow jo- you know, and associates yeah. and they evaluated all these things. And you're, you're li- this is literally in the top 1% of what CMOs in, in similar companies get. And I said to them, listen, go fuck yourself. Most CMOs in our industry are morons who, with all due modesty, can't wipe my butt. And so the fact that you're even comparing me to these idiots is insulting to me. And so we're either going to do something that makes sense or we're not doing this. And, you know, that's kind of where <laughs> I have often conducted myself. And, and so I guess to your point on the optimistic side and the expectation side, I made it in this situation very clear to them where the bar should be set. And the bar is not going to be set around some stupid ass peer group that you say I'm part of. <laughs> so let me give you a different, a, a variation on that particular thing that's a little more, um, a little more PC. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, you mean that wasn't that wasn't like sweet and gentle enough? No, that wasn't. But but I, so I I would not advise my students to be able to have the, that level of conversation. But they have the same problem. So my students will often come to me and they will say things like, "I just got this job offer," and they say, "This is what they this is the the this is the offer they give to MBA students at Stanford." Okay. And I said, and they said they don't negotiate. And I said, okay, number one, I don't believe that. Number two, this has got to be the average offer. And so that means there's a distribution. So by the way, if you are below average or average, you might want to say yes to this offer. But if you're above average, why are you above average? And what are the characteristics about you that make you not part of this group? So they're setting a precedent. You say, "Ah, that's great for those people, but that's not me. I'm over here. And so what is it unique about you that makes you not part of that group that is the average MBA from Stanford? Yes. And And that's the way we change the lens by which we're being evaluated. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes. And, and, so, and so you just said it the nice way I yeah, said exactly. it. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was just saying. I, I teach students. I can't sort of be as provocative as you can. Yeah. And look, but. I'm not, I understand that, you know, punch them twice in the face method isn't always the right answer. Right. <laughs> Especially when you're just getting your MBA and you're starting out. Yeah. So. Now, the other thing I've heard you talk about, and I think you've written about is, um, in any negotiation, there's this there's this thing in the background always called the alternatives, mm-hmm. right? So in many cases, you know, in my life, I grew up in the technology business. And so when you're negotiating a deal with a customer, you're the seller, they're the buyer, you know, there are competitors they can buy from, right? If I'm, if it's a job situation, I'm not the only Stanford yeah. MBA or the only CMO candidate, despite my ranting and raving, right? And so there's always this notion of the alternatives, you know, if not you, if not this product, then some other product. And so um, how do how do I think about managing, if you will, the alternative the alternative scenarios in the negotiation such that I tilt the advantage to getting a good deal done um, and getting the deal that I want done and sort of uh, elbowing out the alternative, so to speak? Well, first, you need to think about it, the alternative. You, a lot of the alternatives you, t- you spoke about are alternatives for your counterpart. 
other people they might hire, other you know, products they might choose. You need to first think about what the alternative is from your perspective. And that is, and, and, and you know, what happens to you in the case of an impasse? And that's really the question you're asking yourself. And that's, that's the answer is, what is my alternative? Now, for many folks, um, what they do when they think about their alternative is they are thinking about uh, basically the alternative as a standard by which they judge acceptability. So if I, so if, let's say this is my alternative course of action um, and I, or my alternative job offer. You and I are negotiating. You want to hire me. I have another job offer. That's my alternative. And I have an offer from them. Too often what we look at is, well, whatever that, whatever that offer is forms the basis for what I'm going to ask for you. And if I can exceed that, I actually am doing well, right? So we use it as a standard by which we judge acceptability. One of the things that I do, which is, is somewhat different, I think actually quite a bit different, but I'll just say somewhat here at the moment, somewhat different is that I say re, you can't actually, this is a really bad strategy because once you use that, this is my standard of acceptability, you have just anchored yourself and your expectations to your alternative. And rather than doing that, think about your alternative as a safety net. So the, the, the story I tell is like, okay, imagine yourself a trapeze artist, right? And you are uh, performing for an audience and something happens in the middle of your act and you end up in the safety net. You are not going to see that as an acceptable performance. You're not going to go, you're not going to jump out of the net and go, ta-da, ta-da, it was great. No. But if you're in the safety net, you're really glad it's there. And that's how I want you to think about it because you're, you need to think about your aspiration, not your alternative as what you're anchoring yourself to. That's number one. Number two, your alternative is only as powerful in concert with your counterpart's alternative, right? Because he or she with the better alternative, on average, walks away with more. That is a, we have got tons of research. Okay, hold on, so slow down, professor. Say that yes. again for me, please. He or she with the better alternative, on average, walks away with more. That doesn't say that so if I have a good alternative, I'll walk away with more. I've got to have better alternative than my counterpart. Does that mean that in any negotiation between two parties, of course, uh, mm -hmm. that there becomes an emergent uh, reality, if I could use that term, maybe actually that's probably the wrong term, perception that one party needs this deal, needs this relationship, needs this transaction, whatever it is, more than the other, and as soon as that happens, that the person with the perceived uh, more, better, different, interesting potential alternatives than the other is in the position of, and I'll use this word on, on purpose, the position of power. Yes, because what happens is that the better my alternative, the easier it is for me to walk away. And the easier it is for me to walk away, if you want to deal with me, the more you have to pay in whatever the metric is. Yeah. To get me to stay. And so is there a perception, and I don't want to move into a deceptive, um, mm -hmm. duplicitous kind of a place, but are there techniques for, if you will, managing perception so that the other side is more likely to think I have better alternatives than they have? Is that something we try to do? Or how, how do you think about that? Well, it turns out that uh, what's interesting is um, when people have better alternatives, uh, and, and again, this is not the relative one. This is just like sometimes I have really good alternatives. I think sometimes I really have poor alternatives. I don't necessarily need to know about yours. But if you just look at me as an individual, I'll act more assertive and aggressive when I have better alternatives because I know I can walk away, right? I'm going to get more in this deal with a relative improvement of my alternative compared to yours. But what we, what we might see is someone might behave more assertively or make more demands or concede less, right? So we can get a sense of, you know, sort of how good or poor an alternative is by the behavior of the individual. So yeah. to give you an example, right? Um, you know, my counterpart who had my co-author when he took his first job as an academic had, I think, 11 job offers and I had one. Guess which one of us did a better job of negotiating, right? Yeah. He could he could play off one, two, three, and four, his most his ranked schools, 
he'd still have another, you know, seven in, in the hold. I had one. My, off, my alternatives were not very good. Yeah. So oh. maybe something's wrong with me. You'll, you'll tell me because you have a, the background to be able to tell me. But I hear this a lot that, um, I, so I'm, I think I'm someone who's known for being a quote unquote tough negotiator. And I am not somebody who's shy about telling anybody to go after themselves. Um, and what I hear today at the stage of life and career that I'm at is, particularly from a lot of the younger people I get involved with, is, oh, well, it's easy for you to do that, you know, because you are where you are. You don't have to worry about the things that I have to worry about, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I, my memory, and, you know, maybe, maybe the scotch has sort of blurred things mm -hmm. a little bit, but my memory is... I was kind of always that way, even when I was terrified about making the rent, that if, if things were going sideways in a deal, I would take a muscular position and say, you know, over my dead body and, 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 and play hardball when I had, you know, to your point, very few alternatives, but I had gotten clear about my boundaries and bottom lines and I was not going to do it. And I am a street fighter. And so I just tell them to, to shove it, even when... I knew damn well if I told him to shove it, I, I wasn't going to be able to make the rent this month. And so I guess A, is something wrong with me? <laughs> and B, I mean, how do, you, how do you help people who have the one offer, not the 11 offers, still do a better deal uh, when, point, in point of fact, they're in a weaker position? Well, primarily what I would say is, the offers and your alternatives really are about how powerful you are, right? But when you focus negotiation on collaborative problem solving, what you're doing is really playing a different kind of game. You're saying uh, it's not about, you know, who's going to, you know, we're going to do a face off and who's going to blink first. What I'm saying here is, is that in that situation, what happens is that I'm actually being quite a bit more strategic I'm not, I, I realize I may not have a particularly powerful situation. That is, I don't have the power on my side, but I'm actually pretty good at being able to frame my proposals as a solution to a problem that you have. And when that happens, you see, all of a sudden, you're not even thinking we're in a negotiation anymore. Because you can imagine, Christopher, that I have a lot of, imagine interacting with me on a daily basis in the same job, right? My colleagues here, when, you know, think of me as a negotiator, right? I study negotiation, I write books, I teach, you know, I do research in negotiation. And so whenever I start talking to them, they're like, you're negotiating, aren't you? I Even go, if it's about where we should go for lunch. It and doesn't when... matter. And so, I, and so then they all get, they get armored up. They're ready for a fight. It's like, I got to win. She's good, ready. You know, I go, no, 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 I'm not negotiating. I don't negotiate. We're solving some problems here. So let's get back into problem solving mode. Yeah. Because I don't negotiate. I solve problems. Yeah. And it changes the tenor of the interaction. That's number one. Number two, one of the things, one of the things about, and this is, this is now we're going to move into gender for a minute here. As a guy, you have one of the benefits of being confident in which people will interpret that confidence as competence. If women were to say exactly the same words that you just said, they would not be perceived as competent. They would be perceived as a bitch. And and I know this is going to make me sound like a dumb guy, and I'm, I'm asking it on purpose, so I know it's a dumb mm -hmm. guy question. Um, but I'll say it anyway. That's a reality, right? Oh, yeah. There's no question that's a reality. You see, one of the challenges, people talk a lot, women, women understand this, and I'm not sure that everybody understands this, but women certainly do, and that is when we negotiate, we're often perceived as greedy, demanding, and not nice, okay? I'm not sure you ever cared whether people thought you were greedy, demanding, or not nice. That just never even came into your mind. No. Who cares? And it doesn't now either. Right. It didn't then, and it doesn't now. Yeah. But you don't get you don't get punished for being greedy, demanding, and not nice in ways that women do. And women get backlash. So for example, I mean, here's the, we distill the research in negotiation on gender, but there are two big findings. Number one, I negotiate as a female. 
Okay, now we're going to sort of rewind the tape and everything is exactly the same. The situation is the same. The, you're the same. The words that the person says is the same, but instead of it being female, it's male. Okay, so everything is identical. In the second situation, I, the person negotiating, I'm going to be better off. I'm going to get more from being a male rather than being a female with exactly the same words. Exactly. So, so I want to make sure I understand. The male with exactly the same words, yeah. the male does better. Yes. That's what the data shows. When negotiating us. for self, yes. For salary or for a raise? No, for or self, something. for me, when I negotiate for me. Okay? Salary, anything, right? Because- Say if buying a car, whatever yeah. it is. If, 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 if Maggie's negotiating for Maggie and Christopher's negotiating for Christopher, we say the exact same thing. We behave plus or minus in a yep. very similar fashion. You'll get more. I Just because I'm a dude. Yeah. Okay, now here's number two. So don't get too cocky because we're about to we're about to bring you down a notch. You're about to uh, you're about to dress yeah. me down. Yeah. Okay. Let me have it. <laughs> okay. Because now I'm not negotiating for me. I'm negotiating for my team. Okay. Women outperform men in representational negotiations, fourteen to twenty two percent. Oh, slow down there, professor. Mm -hmm. What were those percentages? Fourteen to twenty two percent. Better women than men. Outperform men in representational negotiations. So when the social mores, you see, nobody will accuse me of being greedy or demanding or not nice when I'm negotiating for my team. I'm greedy, demanding, and not nice when I negotiate for me. So if you were to go buy a car and you in your mind and in your language said to the car salesperson, um, well, I'm not sure this is a good deal for my family. That's that, a little bit, that, and that's, that's certainly better, but here's an even better one. I'm okay. negotiating for my company because you see, I have to let myself feel the, um, the agency to negotiate and not be perceived as greedy or demanding. So part of what has to happen is, and this is one of the things that when I do talk to groups of women, I say, who are you negotiating for? Hmm. You know, maybe you're negotiating for your team. Maybe you're negotiating for your family. Right. And actually what I say is maybe you're negotiating for every woman who comes after you because people don't think women will negotiate. And so maybe you need to change that mindset of all those people. That's incredibly powerful. And then what do you do for us uh, bulls in China shop who pound our chests and act like, you know, overly aggressive bravado maniacs? I think it's great because what happens is strategically I can behave in a variety of ways that will make you think you have won. When in fact, I have created more value and gotten more of it. So if I'm a guy who wants to do as well as gals do when negotiating for my team or company, um, what's the advice that you would give me? Uh, part of it would be this problem solving perspective. Yeah. Because you see, it's not about just what am I getting for me? You see, I, I, I'm taking into consideration the other side and I'm creating a situation where I first I've taken from, for the women's perspective, I've taken off this, 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 this um, harness of you've got to be nice. I thought yeah. to be nice when I'm negotiating for my team, right? There's no, there's no negative thing associated with me. But what also happens is in general, you're going to find more willingness. And this is one of the things we find in a different dimension, which is, um, sort of bringing now the teams and collaborations and, and teams, collaborative team processing and diversity, women actually um, are actually perceived as better leaders in collaborative organizations than men are. Why? Because it's more problem solving. It's less command and control. Yeah. And again, negotiation is not a command and control process. Right. You just explained something to me that I never understood. So my wife, Carrie, is the best person I know to take to a car dealership to negotiate the purchase of your car. Mm -hmm. And her friends, her sister, yep. family members, like she goes in there, her parents, and like e even with me, you know, the last car I bought, I'm out test driving it. She's in with the sales guy. Mm -hmm. By the time I come back for the test drive, He's slumped down in his chair. He looks like this. And the sort of the look on his face is, hey, if I do whatever she just freaking said, will you get her out of my office? Like, <laughs> she has got him crushed. But then 
her the car her most recent car that she purchased she sort of did it on her own I, mean, I was tangentially involved but she did it on her own and she didn't do anywhere uh, uh near as well mm -hmm. and i couldn't understand why because she is a bulldog just she's amazing but you just explained it to me yeah isn't that fascinating because you know it's not just it's not just that people think we shouldn't be greedy demanding or not nice we think we shouldn't be greedy or demanding or not nice yeah isn't that fascinating? Oh. Now, I, I, I'd be, I'd be, uh, it'd be a shame not to ask you, particularly having just had a male-female discussion on negotiation. Um, could you give me some insight into why and what you're poking around uh, into with diversity? Uh, yeah, actually, um, one of the things that um, I have been really interested in uh, is uh, innovative teams and what makes uh, teams more effective. And so over, over the years of doing research in the area of teams, um, I've really started focusing on um, what are the characteristics that an individual within a team uh, has to, has to uh, reflect in order to get their voice heard, especially when they disagree. So think about a team, it's innovative, and, and, I, and, I, and I'm... A, a, someone who has a disagreement with the core, with the direction the team is going. That's number one. Number two, and these are just the flip sides of the same problem. How do I make a team, how do I create a team that can hear dissenting voices, right? And so this is the kind of perspective that I'm looking at. And, and so in many respects, this is just the same thing as the macro, the macro perspective on negotiation, which is how do we realize the synergy? In negotiation, we call it value creation. In teams, we call it collaboration. It's the, it's the same kind of thing, right? And so that's part of what I've been, I've been sort of trying to uh, untangle um, for decades about sort of how is it people, especially people who disagree, and especially those who may be perceived as what researchers call double minorities. So to tell you what a double minority is, I have to kind of step back a little bit. So um, imagine a team, um, and it's a team, let's say it's a team of, of software engineers, and, uh, I, and, I'm a, and, and you're a member of that team, we're going to make the male, okay, so you're a member of that team, and you disagree on a fundamental issue that's driving the team, okay? You would be a single minority, okay, because you just disagree with the team. Let's say that instead of you disagreeing, it's me disagreeing, okay? I'm female, and I'm a software engineer, and I disagree. Okay, that's a double minority. Or does the fact that I'm follically challenged make me a double minority? <laughs> uh, probably not, because I'm sure that you have probably many people in your team who have the same problem. <laughs> I'm so, just being silly. To, but but so, it so turns you out, you are dissenting in two ways, and I'm yes. dissenting in one, so to speak. Or I could be you, but not. But you could be a marketing person in that software engineer team, and you disagree. Okay, so those are double, both of those are double minorities. I could be double minority because of demographic characteristics. I could be double minority because of exp expertise characteristics, right? And so what happens? Well, it turns out that uh, double minorities are actually much more effective at changing the direction of the team than a single minority is. Because you see, when I'm in a group of engineers, we're all soft, you know, you, it's a, a group of engineers, we're all the same, you know, we're, we're, the, we're, the, we're the startup team that known each other for 10 years and we all got educated at Stanford and we all went to the same classes together. Nobody expects us to disagree, right? We're, we are in sync. That's one of the reasons why similarity attracts. We are in sync. And when one of us disagrees, it's all, it's completely unexpected. And we don't, and, and the team and the individuals in the team just, simply have a hard time dealing with that. But if I'm a marketing person in your group of software engineers, you already expect me to be different. And so when I disagree, you're like, oh yeah, we already knew that. You're that weird marketing person, yeah. okay? And so people expect the disagreement, they can handle the disagreement. Or, or to put it maybe too bluntly, you're the gal, so of course you think about this differently. Right. You're the only gal in the room. Exactly. And so what happens is when I'm the double minority, it turns out that I actually have a bigger impact on the team than a single minority wow. does when they disagree. So, and for why? example, I mean, there's been so much about women in business, women in tech, uh, particularly of late. 
And I think a lot of us, uh, particularly men, have learned a lot in the last year or two around this topic. Certainly my eyes are open in a way that they, they mm -hmm. were not before. Um, and so this is a big aha because one of the things we can say to, in this example, women, is you actually have a huge advantage because if you're dissenting and you're a minority in the room because there's not as many gals, then you actually have a powerful opportunity to make a big difference in the, in the progression of this team. If the team has the capacity to hear. That's why it's the same problem, different side. And so how do we create a, an environment that teams have the capacity to hear dissenting voices? It turns out we have strategies for that. Number one, so one of the things that's, that there, there are a lot of ways to approach this. I mean, you're talking now, you're asking sort of say, how do we negotiate better? Okay, it's going to take me a long time to explain all these things, but let me just give you a few highlights. Number one, one of the things is that where diversity will destroy a team is in, the, is in diversity of the perception of what the goals and, goals and mission and values of the team are, right? So number one is in the launch meeting of a team, we need to be really have an explicit discussion of the mission of the team and what the goals and values are that we will implement in the, in the service of that mission. And then I need an explicit commitment by team members to that mission, goals, and values. Why all of that, you know, sort of um, structure? Because to the extent that we have homogeneity in our view of the goal of the team or the charge of the team, team members will be more open to weird and unusual and sort of blue sky ideas because I believe that you and I have the same goals, so I'm going to be more open to different ways to achieve those goals. Wow. But if I think that you and I have different goals for the team, I'm not going to listen to your crazy ideas because I don't trust you. Professor, you are really teaching me something. And it, 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 it sounds intuitively obvious as, as I'm thinking as you're talking. Mm -hmm. But make, like a lot of things, making it explicit is so powerful. So let me, let me play it back to you to make sure that it's sort of writing to the database. Um, we can have dissenting diversity of ideas, approaches, strategies, da, 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 da. and the way to make room for that is at the very beginning, we have complete 100% agreement, alignment, whatever words you want around mission and goals. Yeah. And if, if, if there's 10 of us working on this initiative and at the very beginning, you're our leader and you say, okay, we've come together and our goals are to achieve these three big things, bam, bam, bam. You do what's required to kind of educate us, get agreement from us that yes, that would be awesome. We want to achieve those things. We're, we're quote unquote aligned to go do those three things. And then as we go forward on the project, we can dissent, we can disagree, we can you know, push and shove each other around intellectually, so to speak. Yep. Um, and we will tolerate if I, or, or we will yes. accept, or we will maybe, we'll, you know, I, I find myself, yeah, I'm fine. I find myself, particularly the longer I've lived on the planet, when somebody says something dissenting or, or that even I have a huge negative reaction to it first, I, I find myself more saying, huh, that's interesting. Tell me why you think that as opposed to thinking you're a freaking moron. Mm-hmm. And so we, when we have alignment and agreement around goals and mission, we can then make room for lots of diverse discussion. Is that, exactly. that's what I'm hearing? Yes, that's exactly what you're hearing. That's awesome. Now I've also heard that, you know, diversity, male, female, diversity, culture, background, religion, color, ba, 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 ba. You know, I hear arguments, you see reports written that when there is diversity of those kinds of things in addition to diversity of ideas that that also can strengthen teams do you see well, that as well or do you uh, where do you it can i mean the diversity demographic diversity that's the kind of diversity you can see right race gender ethnicity age uh, are imperfect signals for deep level diversity which is experience expertise that sort of thing but you could have a group of people who are quite different demographically but let's say they were all lawyers. Well, you don't have a lot of deep expertise difference because legal education teaches you how to think a particular way. And so you have a lot of homogeneity in the thought process. So this diversity 
you might have differences of experience, but you all kind of come at the problem in I the see. same way. So if, if we look like the United Nations, but we're all Stanford trained lawyers, so what? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, so, so, so big D diversity, so to speak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. Now, I want to be super respectful of your time. I think I could probably talk to you about these topics for, you know, 12 more hours. Um, is, is there anything, Maggie, that you'd like to touch on as we uh, as we come to complete? Uh I think that one of the things we haven't spoken about yet, but I just want to sort of end with is that people continually and consistently underestimate the power of simply asking for what you want. Hmm. Could you maybe say a little bit more about that for me? Well, uh, it turns out that people want to actually accommodate requests. And so oftentimes people will say, oh, I couldn't possibly ask for that. Uh, they won't listen to me. And I have two statements that I sort of make when people give me that, situa that, that response. I say, number one, if you don't ask for what you want, how will anybody know what it is you want? And if Isn't you don't true ask in for spousal what, relationships, yes, like I, I, I'm not, yes. I can't read your mind. <laughs> exactly. And number two, if you don't ask for what you want, who will? Yeah. So the power of the ask, it's yeah. actually amazingly powerful. And it's been my experience. Of course, we want to be, uh, uh, we want to do it appropriately and respectfully mm -hmm. and all, you know, we want to be aware of who we're talking to and all that. So, you know, on a, be a screaming baby asking for more food or whatever. But given that, if you just look somebody in the eye and say, you know, Maggie, what, I, what I'd really like here is X. Mm -hmm. We can do that, right? Yes. Or can you say, you know, can you help me? Yeah. Here's what I need. You'll be surprised how often people say, if I can, I will. Can you help me? Here's what I need. Mm -hmm. Very powerful. Anything else, Professor? That's it. I got to go. Yeah. Listen, you are an absolute joy. This has been fantastic. I can't thank you enough. All right. Thanks so much, Christopher. Stay legendary, my friend. You. Whew. Now, I hope you think that was a conversation we're sharing. If there's somebody in your life who uh, you think would love this episode, why not email it to them right now? And um, I want you to know it makes a huge difference when you share this podcast on social media and you email it to your friends, we can feel the power of your shares. We know those numbers are going up because we see them all the time. I want you to know it means the world to me uh, if and when you're willing to share this podcast. The other thing I wanted to uh, tell you is that um, uh, there's a capability on your phone now that makes it, if, you are, if you're an iPhone user, that makes it a lot easier to subscribe to podcasts. All you have to do is have Siri enabled. And if you have Siri enabled, you say, hey, Siri, subscribe to Christopher Lockhead, follow your different. So next time you're at a cocktail party or you're hanging out with your friends, if you want to share this podcast with them, grab their iPhone and say, hey Siri, subscribe to Christopher Lockhead, follow your different. Now, driving growth is what every business wants to do and needs to do, frankly, to thrive. But you know, there's an interesting paradigm, uh, sort of uh, duality or dichotomy uh, with growth, which is it's really hard to manage growth. But it's a game worth playing, believe me. And so if you're a business that's growing and scaling, one of the things that you can do is uh, build yourself a platform for growth. And that platform is NetSuite from Oracle. Uh, NetSuite powers the growth of over 40,000 companies from industries as diverse as advertising, consulting, energy, financial services, manufacturing, software and technology, and more. So check out netsuite.com slash different. And as a listener to this podcast, you'll be able to set up a one hour free growth review with an expert in your industry to talk about how you can master growing and scaling in your business. Check out netsuite.com slash different. And uh, you can find us on the web at Lockhead, L-O-C-H-H-E-A-D.com. We have a new website up for, um, you know, the new recently rebranded and niche down podcast. Check it out. Uh, tell me what you think. Um, when you're there, subscribe to our email list. Because even if you're a subscriber on a podcast platform, we don't know you're there unless you subscribe on Lockhead.com. If you want to send us email, blackhole at Lockhead.com. And you can always follow me on Twitter at Lockhead. All right. We would like to thank the amazing book by our friend and today's guest. Check out Getting More of What You Want, 
how the secrets of economics and psychology can help you negotiate anything in business and in life by Professor Maggie Neal. The good people at OneLifeFullyLive.org, dream, plan, and live your best life. This is a nonprofit that I am uh, deeply proud to be associated with uh, since the beginning. Check us out, the number one, LifeFullyLived.org. A podcast that I love, Grumpy Old Geeks, with our friend and guest on episode number six of Follow Your Different, the infamous, the awesome Jason DeFilippo. <laughs> and uh, it's a great podcast. Check it out, Grumpy Old Geeks. Now, is it time for you to get some help? Why not get a virtual assistant? Our friends at Bottleneck Virtual Assistants are here to help you. Check out bottleneck, all one word, dot online today. And another nonprofit that we love. Habitat for Humanity. Habitat's vision is of a world where everyone has a decent place to live. Check out Habitat.org today. All right, I need to remind you that this podcast is the sole property of the Lockhead Oddcast Network, and we would love you just a little bit extra if you shared it. All rights do remain disturbed. Uh, we must warn you that this podcast is clearly produced in a studio that does contain nuts. Uh, remember to teach kids to keep score. It Matters by John's Crazy Socks. Shower with a friend. Thank you so much, Candy Dandy. I love you, Mom and Dad. And hey, Colin, this oddcast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Today, our deepest apologies go out to Doug Parker, Chief Executive Officer of American Airlines. Sorry, Dougie. We just ran out of time for you. That's it. Thank you so much for investing part of your life with me. Uh, I really do appreciate it. Until we hang out again, follow your different.